We are joined today by Dr. Tamara Walter. Dr. Walter received her doctorate in anthropology from the University of Texas at Austin in 2000. She is currently an associate professor at Texas Tech University where she teaches classes such as the archeology span of death, the prehistory of the Southwest and South American archeology. span Her research interests include historic archeology, span mission studies, colonialism and conflict, negotiating identities in colonial settings and coastal Ecuador. Her, pub her recent publication, Foodways at a Colonial Military Frontier Outpost in Northern New Spain, the Faunal Assemblage from Presidio San Sabah, 1757 to 1772, co-authored with Arlene Fradkin, discusses the role of food in the store and the struggle to survive along the frontier of Spanish Texas. With that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Tamara Walter. Thank you, Drew. Um, so it's October, which means it's uh, Texas Archaeology Month. And, and in honor of that, I thought I would talk about uh, one of the sites here in Texas that I have been privileged enough to work at. Now, as a historical archaeologist, we have or we are uniquely equipped to investigate things about the past that we can't access directly from historical records. And I think the archaeology that was done at Presidio San Saba is a really good example of that. <clears throat> so I want to provide you with a brief um, uh, background and history of the site itself. Presidio San Saba was a Spanish military fort established in 1757. It's located today in what is now Menard County, Texas, in the town of Menard. It is the largest Spanish fort in Texas, and at its peak, there were some three to 400 people that resided here. And that included not just the soldiers and officers and commanders, but also their families, as well as some civilian settlers. Now there were uh, a, a variety of reasons for why this fort was established, but chief among them was a concern of protecting the Spanish frontier. Um, Texas was kind of seen as, at this time, was seen as a, as a, a, a buffer. And the Spanish were very concerned about other colonial powers, in particular France, for making incursions into the Texas frontier. Now, during this time, there was a lot of lucrative mining going on in northern Mexico in the silver mines. And so they wanted to protect that. So having a presidio um, in this area, they hoped would help that effort. Another reason for the establishment of the Presidio in this area was to help protect the neighboring mission of San Saba. The mission of San Saba was established at the same time as Presidio San Saba, both in 1757. And the Presidio also helped to protect and, and, and provide support for the missionary uh, operation there. Now, Another reason that the fort was placed here was because of the raids that were occurring in San Antonio. Um, over the decades, the uh, missions and the civilian settlement at San Antonio had experienced a number of raids on their herds. And, uh, and in particular, these, her these raids were being carried out by the Lipan and also the Comanche. And they hoped that by placing a presidio in Comanche Apache territory that this would help reduce the number of raids. Another reason for the establishment of San Saba was the hope that if this enterprise was successful, they could establish a growing civilian population to occupy the region. And then this could, this could serve as sort of a base of operations for expanding the Spanish territory, moving the boundary of, of New Spain further north, perhaps as far as the northern high plains. Um, and certainly you can't discount the fact that there were a lot of rumors about silver deposits in the area. So um, that was certainly another motivating factor for placing the Presidio here and at this time. Now, <clears throat> What we know from the historical records is a lot of information regarding sort of the military affairs. We know about some of the skirmishes that happened. We know about the commanders. We know, for example, that there were two major commanders at the garrison, the first being Colonel Perea, who was there from 1757, 1759-60. Um, and while he was there, and he, he was the individual that uh, was there at the time of the establishment of the fort, and he 
uh, built a wooden fort with temporary structures inside, wall and daub, muddle and stick type structures with a log stockade. Uh, he was replaced by Captain Rabago, Felipe Rabago Itran, in 1760, and Captain Rabago replaced that wooden fort with a stone fort. And Rabago was basically the commander all the way up until the end of uh, the uh, tenure of the, uh, of the Presidio. One of the things that we didn't know uh, prior to excavations was whether or not that wooden fort and the stone fort were in the same place. The records didn't tell us anything about that. So we wanted to know, was the wooden fort somewhere else and then they decided to build the stone fort nearby or is one built on top of the other? Now, <clears throat> I can't really talk about the Presidio without talking about the mission and the significant events that unfolded there. The mission uh, was established about four miles away from the Presidio and that decision would prove fatal. The missionaries did that on purpose because they wanted to create some distance between the Presidio soldiers and the mission inhabitants. Um, in the past, they'd experienced trouble with the soldiers harassing the neophytes. And so they wanted to try to reduce that friction. And they did that by it, it, extending the distance between the two. Um, that was a problem because when uh, the mission was attacked, they couldn't get um, help from the Presidio fast enough. So what happened prior to the attack was, as I mentioned, this was a mission that was established for the Lipan Apache. And the Lipan and the Comanche were enemies. And when the Comanche found out that they, the Spanish had formed this alliance with the Lipan, it angered them. So the Comanche, along with their Norteño allies, um, came to the mission, they entered peacefully, and then once inside, they proceeded to ransack and destroy the mission. They uh, killed the priests, they also killed five or six other individuals, Spanish individuals who were there, and there was not enough time for uh, the Presidio soldiers to respond. Now, after the destruction, it was just 13 months after it was founded, the mission was not reopened, but the Presidio did continue to operate. And another thing that I think is important to note here that speaks to the, uh, the importance of archaeology is that this mission was considered a lost mission, and it took a long time for it to be found. And it was through the astute uh, detective work of um, some archaeologists, uh, in particular Kay Hines and, and Grant Hall, along with uh, Mark Wolf, um, that led to the discovery of this mission. So they were actually able through some research in the archives, but also just going out into the field, um, doing some survey and, and excavations, were able to find this lost, so-called lost mission. But the events here um, really, I think, uh, were, were telling for what was coming for, for the Presidio. Even though they remained open, they struggled while they were here. And we do know that from the historical records. There were periods of malnourishment uh, and disease. The supply trains that were coming up from San Antonio to bring much needed necessities oftentimes weren't making it. They were um, stopped by, by uh, hostile groups um, who would come in and raid the supplies. And so some of the food just wasn't getting there. And as a result, they suffered. We also know that there was disease that ravaged the garrison and they continued to, to have uh, attacks carried out on the Presidio from Comanche and other groups. Uh, and at times they just had to hole up in the Presidio. So you can imagine it was pretty awful being there and they're very isolated. So so at the time, um, at the time of the destruction of the mission, you're a long ways away from San Antonio. But in 1762, Rabago establishes a uh, another mission, Mission San Lorenzo, which is about 100 miles to uh, almost directly south, uh, southwest of, of the Presidio, in an attempt to try to reestablish relationship with the Le Pen. Um, I think his thought here was that if he could bring the Lepan into the missions, he could form an alliance with them and that would help him um, 
deal with the Comanche who were um, quite strong and um, gave them a lot of trouble. Uh, what ended up happening though was as these problems got worse at San Saba, they often retreated to Mission San Lorenzo, which if I didn't mention, it was established in 1762. Rabago took his men, the garrison, they retreated to San Lorenzo only to be ordered back. He did go back, but then he returned to Mission San Lorenzo and refused to, to go back to his post. And as a result, he was replaced. Now, in 1769, effectively, both of these sites were abandoned and nothing was happening there. Uh, officially, I think they say it was 1770 or 71 when they were closed down, but uh, pretty much the end was in 1769. And we no longer have much going on at the Presidio or, for that matter, at San Lorenzo. Um, so that kind of gives you a picture of what we know, what was going on from the history. There are a lot of aspects of the history that are things about the site that we wanted to know that we weren't getting specifically from historical records. And that is, as I've said, one of archeology's span strengths. As I mentioned, the architecture, um, we uh, were very curious to know whether or not the first Presidio, the, the the wooden fort and the stone fortress were in the same place. Um, we also were very interested to, under, to understand the evolution of the building there. And in 1767, we know that there was a military inspection tour done along the northern frontier of New Spain and they visited San Saba. During that visit, there were two maps made and there was a description of the Presidio, which in this image you can see here at the top, that's based on those uh, depictions. The two maps, however, differed in the fact that the, the Southeast Bastion was different in both images. And so we were hoping that the archeology span could clarify that. You can see here, you've got a Northwest Bastion and a Southeast Bastion. You can uh, note that there's even a two-story structure and there are rooms that line um, the perimeter of the stone fort. So we had all of that information and we knew that in the Northwest corner near that round bastion that we had the, the, a chapel, the soldier's quarters, or the, excuse me, the officer's quarters um, and uh, the supplies. And this is probably where Rabago was residing. So we had all of that information, but there were a few things that uh, we were confused about that could only be illuminated through uh, archeological investigation. Another thing that we were examining through our investigations was um, the daily life of these ordinary folks who were here. You know, part of our job, I think, is to try to bring to life what it was for the everyday person. And archaeology can do that for us. We look at the things that people used on a day-to-day -day basis, the things they made and they used and they threw away and that we're fortunate enough to find. So um, learning not just about what the officers were doing, but some of these uh, uh, lower ranking soldiers and, and the women and children too is an important part of that. And Another area that I think we shine as archeologists is our ability to, to talk about food ways. And uh, at uh, uh, Presidio San Saba, one of the things we wanted to know a little bit more about was the frontier diet. Because these guys are isolated, they're not getting all their food all at the same time. How did they deal with that? What did that look like? Uh, were they able to reproduce the typical frontier diet? Um, and we mainly were able to address that by excavating some of the large trash pits where the byproducts of their meals are found, basically uh, final remains or animal bones from a variety of animals that we know that they were consuming here. So the bottom Im image here you see uh, just illustrates the areas of excavation, those colored boxes from different seasons, shows you that we had a sample of the site from pretty much every aspect of it. Uh, we weren't able to excavate as much in that Northwest corner because of the, there was a reconstruction done there in the 1930s. And we couldn't really move any of that because that now constitutes a historical site. So we focused on other parts of the Presidio, um, including the uh, interior compound, as well as some of the architectural structures, the room, and also uh, that Southeast Bastion. 
So um, at the top here, what you're seeing is an image of the exposed Southeast Bastion that we were able to excavate during the excavation seasons that took place roughly from 2000 to 2011. And then this map here I included so you could see it's a little clearer the configuration of that smaller Southeast Bastion. And the artist rendition below is based on that. And that's what we think it looked like when it was in use. Um, during our excavations in that area, we were also able Able to find evidence for the earlier wooden structure. It was underneath one of the stone foundation or one of the walls. So that answered one of our questions. And we were also able to investigate some of the rooms. And in the investigation of those rooms, we were able to, to determine the, uh, the size and the configuration of those rooms. And all of that information was then used to help guide the, um, uh, the future interpretation of that site. And then I'll, I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. So in addition to answering some of those questions, now knowing what the actual configuration of the bastion looks like and where the two presidio, uh, the, the two forts were, and also, oh, one thing I forgot to mention, we also found structures along one of the walls that were not depicted on either of those 1767 maps, which tells us they continued to build after 1767, probably adding rooms along that south wall, maybe for storage or even for uh, domestic space. Um, but in addition to that, another thing that we targeted was information that could tell us something about daily life. Now, obviously, this is a, a military fort, so it isn't unexpected that you're going to find items related to the, the Presidio soldiers that made up the, the uh, population here. Um, things like uh, uh, horse gear was quite um, uh, abundant, finding things like part of this headstall, headstall plate from a, a bridle, and you can see the little jinglers, and I included the sketch here so you could see what that looked like when it was all uh, in one piece. Um, those jinglers, those little decorative elements were quite popular during the colonial era, and obviously a lot of ammunition, lead shot, and gun flints that were made from local, locally available chert that was used in, in weapons, um, and even parts of guns like this Michelet flintlock uh, part, which was part of a Spanish Michelet flint, flintlock pistol, and I provided a, an example of that here in this image. But it wasn't just the soldiers who were living here, right? Uh, it's also women and children, and um, these items of personal adornment that were also discovered at Presidio San Saba speak to the presence of women. We see that they were taking care to adorn themselves with different kinds of jewelry, uh, earrings and uh, heart charms. In addition, we found numerous uh, religious medals and medallions and crosses and crucifixes like the ones seen here, which speak to the religious underpinnings of this um, site and you know the importance that religion played in the everyday lives of these folks. Now, um, other aspects of daily life include uh, artifacts such as these um, clothing items. Now, you know, perishable items like cloth, we rarely are able to recover, but we do find things like buttons. And you can see there's a series of buttons, uh, button crowns. Um, most of these are copper brass buttons and uh, an occasional bone button that would have been mostly worn by men. And uh, if you were a person of high status, you would have, like an officer, you would have had buttons that were uh, usually gold or silver. So probably most of these buttons were from your everyday folks, although I can't say for sure. Um, in addition to the buttons, we also found uh, segments of buckles. You can see that in the top uh, from the style from that period. So those things have been recovered. It gives us insight into what kinds of clothing they were wearing. Coats and things would have been necessary. They would have needed buttons as these images show from, from Costa paintings from that period, uh, the different kinds of clothing that required buttons. In addition, this little item in the center is actually part of a, a cufflink set. And it's copper. Uh, it's hard to tell because it is a lot of patina there. But it's copper and it's got a glass paste inset. And if you look closely, you can actually see in there uh, the painting of a, a thistle. Um, and this was most likely something that was worn by one of the officers. Uh, 
Another surprising thing that the archaeology revealed to us at San Saba is information about leisure time, what people were doing on their downtime. On um, the top, you'll see here a, a bone die. And we know that gaming and gambling was popular, and certainly that was the case here at San Saba. And it, it was likely a, a diversion for um, the folks living here and under such really, uh, at times, harsh, harsh circumstances. Uh, Another thing that we found quite a few of are these mouth harps at the bottom. So people were enjoying making and listening to music and it could also probably create a diversion um, and, and something that they likely enjoyed doing. In the middle, these lead discs with the holes in the middle are what we believe to be wizards, which were child's, uh, children's uh, toys. And you'd put a string in there and wrap it around in a certain way, and then you could pull it, and that would make a sound. And they called these things wizards. So uh, evidence for kids, too, in the form of, of uh, these toys that were found in several areas within the Presidio. Now, I mentioned earlier the potential that archaeology has in, in, in speaking to foodways and, and diet, and, and that is certainly the case here at the Presidio. There were numerous small pits, and then we had two really large pits, trash pits, that were full of Spanish colonial trash, which the majority of which was made up of faunal or animal bones. And from that uh, study of these faunal remains, we were able to learn a little something about the colonial diet and, and particularly in the context of this Presidio. Again, keeping in mind that supplies were sometimes intermittent. Uh, sometimes they had a lot of stuff and sometimes they didn't have anything at all. And they certainly did struggle nutritionally, nutritionally during uh, different periods of time uh, while they were at San Saba. This still life and this Casta painting kind of give you some <laughs> idea of cooking and the kinds of things that might be found in the kitchen and food. We know that in New Spain, cattle or beef was a, a much bigger part of the diet than it was in the old world because cattle did so well here. So it really isn't surprising that we see a lot of cattle in the um, faunal remains found at San Saba. We know they had herds here, but they also had trouble with those herds because they were constantly raided. Um, in addition to the beef that's represented in the, these uh, remains, we are also finding evidence for sheep and goat and pig. So a lot of the uh, old world domesticates are here, but alongside of that are wild fauna. So we know that they were fishing in the San Saba River for some of their food. They were also probably um, hunting local Locally, we see evidence for deer, um, other wild game, and birds, uh, and, and that was probably something they had to resort to when times got really tough in terms of supply, especially when they couldn't rely on their traditional foods like sheep and, and goat and, and pig and, uh, and cow. So that is, is uh, something that also, again, we can directly address through the analysis of these food remains. And it's not just the food remains such as bone that, that tells us something about that. Um, the ceramics are also quite informative. We can look at the kinds of ceramics that they were using to set their table, what they were uh, purchasing. And um, what's interesting about that too is that you've got this far flung colonial settlement way far away from, from the old world and from Mexico City and, and from Seville where some of these supplies were coming in from. But what we're seeing here uh, represented or reflected at San Saba is their connection in the, uh, uh, or interaction in the global economy. So New Spain was obviously trading with a lot of different folks and that's that's represented here. We see uh, ceramics coming uh, uh, from uh, Asia, uh, from other parts of Europe. You've got not only Mexican mahalikas, which were used to set the table and, and that's what you would eat those were your tablewares, but also Spanish olive jars, which were used for storage and uh, lead glazed ollas for cooking that coming from Mexico along with those mahalikas. Uh, uh, the, the porcelains were coming in on the Manila galleons and being brought to the frontier uh, via Mexico and the overland um, uh, 
uh, trade and, and multi-tier supply trains that were coming up, uh, uh, along with some English ceramics and even some French faience. So um, this is another aspect of the history of this place that uh, archaeology can really get at, I think. Um, and it isn't just the ceramics. So it's also things like other domestic items like these uh, uh, metal artifacts, which includes an iron uh, utensil knife, um, along with copper objects, this copper uh, kettle handle, and the long copper handle in the middle there is from a chocolate pot. They love their chocolate. And that handle, you can see in the bottom still life there, uh, in the center is a chocolate terra pot and, and the long handle there was to facilitate the heating of the chocolate over the fire. And that's what we have there in the middle is a handle from one of those items. In addition to sheets of copper that would be used to uh, uh, patch other uh, copper kettle vessels, things like that, that they probably didn't have a lot of. So they made use of them and reused them and recycled them as much as they could, as well as, uh, as, well as these glass artifacts on the bottom, which actually represent parts of um, wine bottles. And of course, wine would have been a, um, a necessary item for these folks. So, um, you know, this is just a, a small glimpse into some of the things we learned via archaeology at Presidio San Saba. And I'm showing you this picture here so you can see what the site looks like today. Uh, in the 1930s, as I mentioned, the WPA did some um, reconstruction in the northwest corner here. And the, the, um, that was an area we couldn't investigate too much. But when initially when you would come to visit the site and you'd see, you would see that, that main entrance and then the, that round bastion with the crenellated top and then all those little buildings in the Northwest corner, that was it. So when people came, they thought that was all that was, um, uh, 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 that was all that, that the Presidio was, that was the entire size of it. But um, with this, uh, reinterpretation and, and the reconstruction or partial reconstruction of the site, which was guided by the archaeological investigations, they were able to build some partial walls. The community there at Menard got some, some uh, money in order to do this work, and they were able to rebuild part of the, the exterior wall so that when visitors come today, they can appreciate the full size of it. And in addition to um, doing a more accurate reconstruction of these ruins, we architecturally, we were also able to help contribute to the signage interpret and the interpretation at the site. So new signage was put up and that combined both the archeology span and the history of the site. So when you come to the site today and everybody, everybody should, if they get a chance, this is what you'll see. Um, new signage and uh, a little bit better picture of what the site looked like. So in kind of closing, um, I just want to reiterate that, you know, Presidio San Saba is a good example for why Texas archaeology matters. Uh, archaeology can provide us with a much fuller picture of the past. Um, it uh, can address questions that, particularly for historical sites, that you're not going to get at through uh, historical documents alone. It gives voice to those who are silenced in the historical record, uh, disenfranchised group, women and children, you know, the folks that aren't always talked about. We can address that. And uh, that's the beauty of, of archaeology. And, and literally, um, we touch the past. We handle and touch the things that people, people made and used in the past, everyday people. And we can help bring that history to life. And, uh, you know, the goal here is that we can um, make connections with visitors who come to this site and, uh, and, and, and hope that they can um, appreciate the experience of the, the human experience of being at this site through not just the, the, uh, the objects themselves, but the whole story, both what the history tells us and the archeology span tells us. Because in the end, what we're hoping to do is to help preserve Texas history. So that's it, that's all Thank I got. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Walter. Um, if you've got a minute, I do have a few questions for you. Sure. Um, so I'm curious if, uh, and I'm sorry if you already touched on this, but uh, was Presidio San Saba um, ever engaged in any conflict? Was it ever attacked? Did the soldiers ever go out onto the frontier and engage in, in warfare? Yeah, there were skirmishes. I wouldn't know if you call them battles, but um, okay. they were attacked. 
Mm -hmm. One, um, they were out uh, patrolling. Um, you know, there were times when they couldn't leave the uh, the confines of the Presidio because they could see the Comanche out um, just beyond on a hill. And uh, there weren't, I wouldn't call it full-scale battles. Oh, but you do actually, actually, I'm sorry, I should back up. <laughs> After the attack on the mission, uh, Perea actually organized a punitive campaign to punish the um, individuals who were responsible for the attack on the mission. But it took him uh, months and months to pull that together. And uh, by the time that he got up to the Red River where, um, actually along the Spanish fort is the name of the site where this, this battle happened. You know, it was, it, it, it was a, sign, a significant time and had already passed after the attack. And he gets there and they had they engaged in a battle and a couple of people are, 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 are killed on both sides. He claims it as a great victory, Priya does, but really it's kind of a draw. But that I would say was the biggest um, engagement that they had while they were there. Otherwise you're talking about a lot of skirmishes that were occurring uh, as they were trying to carry out patrols or meet the supply trains um, or even just take care of the, the herd, um, mm -hmm. the Presidio um, herds. Uh, so. Yeah, that's that's what I, I, I can tell you about that. Well, uh, with that in mind, um, is there a cemetery associated with the Presidio? Um, we were never able to locate a cemetery. Um, mm. And there's all kinds of theories about where it is, where it may be. Uh, perhaps it was even moved. But even still, if we had encountered it, even if it had been moved, we should have seen some evidence for it. We have yet to been able to locate mm -hmm. that. But certainly a number of people did die while they mm -hmm. were there. You had, uh, um, you had smallpox uh, that affected them. Um, some of them might be buried at San Lorenzo when they retreated there. We know that uh, several individuals <coughs> were buried underneath the, the uh, floor of the chapel. And uh, it may be that they were placed underneath the chapel within the confines of the Presidio, but that part of the site, because of the WPA work, they dug up a lot of those foundations. Ooh. And mm -hmm. I wonder if any of that stuff got moved or destroyed. All right, well, thanks. Uh, one, last, one last question. You know, uh, you mentioned a few archeologists who uh, sort of uh, spearheaded this work. Um, yeah. But then there's a lot of photos of what appear to be volunteers or other. Oh yeah, thank you. Yes, <laughs> I should. I, I yeah, the the work that was done here was done in con conjunction um, with uh, Texas Tech University, our field schools, along with the Texas Archaeological Society. So we had with the TAS. Uh, the Texas Archaeological Society. We had three field seasons with them, and I think our first year we had five or 600 people wow. working, which even though they're only there for a week, you get a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> and, and then they came, they came the following year in 2004. And then in the 250th anniversary of the founding, they came in 2007. Uh, we did another field school there with them. So a lot of that work could not have been done without them. So thank you for reminding me because I was remiss in, mission, in, in mentioning um, their contribution. Sure. Well, thanks again. And uh, if any of our viewers have any questions for Dr. Walter, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Okay. Thank you, Drew. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.